The University of Manitoba campuses are located on the regional lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Ochi Cree, Dakota, Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Metis Nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. So welcome tonight, half a century, MLA 50th anniversary, our celebration and homecoming. So in a nutshell, the Master of Landscape Architecture, MLA, program at the University of Manitoba, Faculty of Architecture, celebrates its 50th anniversary in 2022. The Department of Landscape Architecture wants to highlight this momentous event in a modest but dignified way with all departments and programs of the Faculty of Architecture, students, alumni, friends, affiliates and professional associations. A series of events will be prepared with the friendly support of the Faculty of Architecture for the academic year 2022-2023. The graduate program in landscape architecture at the University of Manitoba was Canada's first of its kind. It resulted from the vision of the late Dean of Architecture, John A. Russell. You might recognize or remember the name. Its establishment was facilitated by the appointment of Alexander Rattray as head of the program in July 1969. The initial three-year graduate course of study was offered through the university's Natural Resource Institute in 1970. The Master of Landscape Architecture program was formally accepted by the province of Manitoba in 1972. In the fall of 2022, the MLA program graduated more than 440 students. I think there's some lists on the, there are some lists on the tables. Students have originated from all regions of Canada and many other countries. 5.35, it's time for the Dean. <laughs> The Dean of the Faculty of Architecture, Mimi, moved last summer from the largest saltwater lake landscape in the Western Hemisphere into a landscape which hosts the 10th largest freshwater lake by surface area in our wonderful but in danger, on, on our wonderful but endangered planet. Mimi, you are welcome. Good evening, everyone. I'm a little shorter. I think that works. So welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this very special event. I'm excited to be here with you to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Master of Landscape Architecture program at the University of Manitoba. 50 years, five decades, half a century, that is quite an accomplishment and good cause for celebration. Let's think for a moment what was going on 50 years ago. Queen Elizabeth already had been on the throne for 20 years. Pierre Trudeau was the Prime Minister of Canada. In Manitoba, William John McKeague was the Lieutenant Governor and Edward Schreier was the Premier. Frank Calder became the first Indigenous cabinet minister in Canadian history when he was appointed to the cabinet of British Columbia. And Muriel McQueen Ferguson became the first female speaker of the Senate of Canada. Closer to home, 1972 also was the year that Winnipeg was merged into a megacity. 1972 marked the year that Canada banned cigarette advertisements on film, radio, and television and the World Hockey Association was established with four teams from Canada, including the Winnipeg Jets. Elsewhere in the world, 
tragedy struck at the Munich Olympics, and five White House operatives were arrested for burglarizing the offices of the Democratic National Committee, marking the start of the Watergate scandal. On a lighter note, Roberta Flax, the first time I ever saw your face, was at the top of Billboard's singles chart, while Canadian radio was featuring Stairway to Heaven by Led Zeppelin and Don McLean's American Pie. And I think I still remember most of the words to both of those songs. And in case you're wondering, Justin Bieber wouldn't be born for another 22 years. <laughs> Back at the University of Manitoba, Ernest Serlick was the president, and Roy Sellers was the dean of the Faculty of Architecture. Leading up to the formal acceptance of the Master of, Archi Master of Landscape Architecture program by the province of Manitoba in 1972, Alexander Rattray, who we've just heard, was appointed head of the graduate program in landscape architecture in July 1969. The program was the first of its kind in Canada and was part of the vision of Dean John Russell, and of course, we're gathered here in the building named after John Russell. Today, our Master of Landscape Architecture program is one of just four programs accredited by the Canadian Society of Landscape Architects. So we're very proud of that. So with that quick glimpse back in time, I welcome you to this celebration and I congratulate the Department of Landscape Architecture Pro on this very special occasion. So welcome everyone. So thank you very much, Mimi. Oh, maybe. Our next guest, Tracy Bauman, received a BA Honors 96 from UFM and an MA from York University. She's the exec executive director of alumni relations and had been with the university for almost six years. She's a proud alum whose role involves developing and fostering the university's engagement and outreach activities for donors, alumni, international and external community members and other stakeholders to inspire deep and long-term relationship between the university and its constituents. And a little bit on a private note, you know, there's, there are no secrets on the internet. I think you had a similar kind of anniversary last year in your home and I found a comment, 50 years has never looked so good. So welcome, Tracy. Thank you for that. So what the, the 50 years who's never looked so good was my husband turned 50 uh, last year. Uh, my birth, my 50th is in a few years. So uh, so thank you for that. <laughs> yeah, just 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 to clarify. <laughs> So, so thank you for allowing me to be here. I'm so delighted to see all of you here in person, and I'm sure you keep hearing that. We're so happy to be here in person, in person, but I don't think it can be understated. You know, for so long, it's been that we haven't been able to do this, and this is such a meaningful way to come together for such a pivotal milestone uh, within the faculty and for the department. So, Thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. Thank you from your alma mater. It's just so nice to have so many of you here and there's so many graduates of a variety of years that are here. So, so thank you for staying connected with your alma mater. It's, uh, it's really important. Now, um, as was mentioned, I am a very proud UM alumna, uh, but I have a confession to make and that is I am not an architect. I'm an arts grad, I'm a poli-sci grad, so sorry. <laughs> I don't have the background experience that you do. You are all very creative. Uh, creative people who create wonderful, amazing things, and we're all the better for it in our world. So, so thank you for all that you do. So I'm going to try to be very quick. Really, my job here is to welcome you and also to uh, let you know that, as was said, it is homecoming 2022, and there's so much going on campus. If you, I encourage you, if you haven't, Please walk around campus, please take a drive around campus, maybe come tomorrow to the football game, tickets are free, uh, and the women's soccer game, there's lots going on, and it's been so wonderful also to have our students back again. I mean, it is so vibrant, and just seeing people 
just groups of people walking and walking around talking and, and with each other at, this, at Starbucks, like wherever they are. This is the way a university campus was meant to be. And it's just so nice to see so many people here. So uh, as I said, there's been lots that have been going on with homecoming. Uh, after today, as I said, there's, there's some Bison games going on tomorrow. So I encourage you to go to that. Um, so I know that my, my table unfortunately doesn't have it because I took our coffee. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I'll bring it back. But Brandy produced this, and it was really amazing to see. All of you are in here, the 440 graduates of the program, and that's really amazing. And then I also did a little bit of digging to find out how many graduates there are in the Faculty of Architecture, and there's just under 7,500 out of 186,000 alumni that live in over 140 countries around the world. That is a significant population of University of Manitoba graduates. And so you're, this is a, a one group, a very sizable, wonderful group. So thank you for being here. Thank you for staying connected. Please come back. You're here for this milestone anniversary, but please keep coming back to homecoming. And each time Mimi sends you an email or, or asks you to come to something, please accept that invitation. We really are all the better for it because of you. So please, please do return to your alma mater. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful anniversary and happy homecoming. Thank you very much, Tracy, for accepting our invitation. We know you're on high demand these days. You know, everybody wants to have you, but you decided to be here with us with the 15th. So thank you very much. Chardin de Metis, Popol. That's what pops up in my mind when I introduce the next speaker. It's the name of a project which was one of the six gardens chosen to participate in the 16th edition of the International Grand Métis Garden Festival in 2015. Megan and Susie Melo delivered the winning entry and they went there to realize their idea with the helping hands of some friends, as far as I remember. The Rayford Gardens and the Jardin de Métis Festival are a must-see stop for anyone visiting the Gaspé in the Lower St. Lawrence. Megan is a senior associate at a local design firm and a passionate contributor to the local and regional design culture. She's a graduate of both our Masters in Landscape Architecture and Environmental Design program. And Megan is the current MALA president. Welcome, Megan. Thank you, Dimar, for the lovely introduction. So, on the behalf of the Manitoba Landscape Arch Association of Landscape Architecture, am I not on? I speak really loud, so I can really project my voice if I need to. Batteries are out. <laughs> <laughs> Can everyone hear me in the back? I can carry on. Okay. Um, okay, so on the behalf of the Manitoba Association of Landscape Architects, it is my honor <clears throat> to welcome all of you to celebrate this momentous milestone for the Department of Landscape Architecture. I would also like to extend my an especially warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Robert Alsop, for his contribution in the establishment of the Masters of Landscape Architecture program. So, since graduating 12 years ago, I have maintained a great sense of pride for my, my University of Manitoba education. The legacy and reputation of this program is evident when I attend CSLA conferences and reconnect with the peers and see how, how they've built their successful careers using the knowledge from this university. By choosing to live and develop my career in Manitoba, I am privileged to remain closely connected to the department through events <laughs> through events and my MALA volunteer activities. I believe it speaks a lot to the quality of the master's program that even though it has been over a decade since my last all nighter, which was spent upstairs, um, that I reflect fondly on those experiences and the lasting relationships I have built with other students and faculty members. So it is my great pleasure tonight that on the behalf of the Manitoba Association of Landscape Architects, we are donating 
$5,000 to the new 50th anniversary scholarship. We strongly believe that will help the graduates of the future continue the legacy and recognition of this amazing program. So thank you very much for inviting me to speak tonight, and I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Thank you, Megan. That's quite a number. I hope that doesn't create too much pressure for our next guest. No, from Mala to CSLA, no worries. <laughs> no, we, we received greetings from the CSLA and the current president, Chris Grosset. The president elected for the next term is from Winnipeg, Manitoba. And first of all, I didn't know what we can expect because I know he's a great skater. Maybe, did you bring your skateboard? Probably not. You played for a punk band, isn't it, when you were younger? Do you have your guitar? Mm, okay. So I don't know what we will expect tonight, so I'm curious. So please welcome Bob Summers. Bob. Now it's just a letdown, I guess. Um, it's great to be back here, uh, especially after the last couple of years that we've had. Um, 30 years ago, uh, I started working in a garden center. I started meeting, I remember meeting Charlie, I mean, remember meeting Ted, I remember uh, Cynthia, I saw you out here. Uh, I remember Natasha, so many people coming into the garden center and it was at a time in my life where I'm out of high school, I'm trying to figure out what to do. And I started meeting all these landscape architects and it became clearer to me and I remember the first day being here 28 years ago in this room and you know, you're in your room of uh, 120 students and you're undergrad class and you know who's going into what you know department and there were two of us that put up our hand to go into landscape architecture and it was uh, myself and Monica Giesbricht uh, who both put up our hands that day and uh, the, the class grew by the time we got into the master's program um, and so I didn't know what I was doing before then and really it became very formative to me to, to join this place and it really served as a foundation this whole school served as a foundation framework for everything that I've done the journey to become a landscape architect that I'm still on. It's, a, it's obviously, as we all know, a nonstop journey. Um, this, the strength of this profession that we're in is it's, it's diversity, it's breadth, and, and our sh shared fundamental values. Um, it's represented in the work that the CSLA has done with the Canadian Landscape Charter, um, and, and it kind of reflects the almost 90 years of our organization. Uh, we welcome everyone back in two years from now. Uh, to Congress in Winnipeg uh, in 2024 because that'll be the 90th anniversary of the CSLA, the 50th anniversary of the MLA, and it will be my 50th birthday too. So it's a perfect year <laughs> to bring everything together. Um, to, so fast forward to today, uh, I'm, I'm in private practice here in Winnipeg and I happen to be um, uh, the president-elect for the Canadian Society of Landscape Architects, which I'm very honored and proud to be. Um, the previously before me, I saw David Wagner out here, I know he has been president before. Uh, Jim Patterson was the last one from Winnipeg. Um, there, there's a long list of, of alumni from, from this school that have really helped shape and build the Canadian Society of Landscape Architects. And I'm, I stand on those shoulders. And so, um, for a bit of a tangent, um, and I can't quite follow up exactly with what uh, Megan just did, um, so, but just a bit of a tangent, um, this, this world that we live in here in Winnipeg is, is a microcosm for the world. It's a, it's a small world. It's built on relationships. And when I was in this program, I was very fortunate to have a, a group of friends and a, a larger class that we all got along really well. And I'm sure everyone can evoke this same conversation, how the experience here was all about those conversations, how we challenged each other, how we goofed off once in a while, how we, you know, how we actually got through the process. I, if you remember, if anyone watched that Beatles documentary, Get Back, and saw how much goofing off they did to write their songs, it's a key part of this creative process. It actually is critical. We played a lot of gin rummy. Um, 
but this collection of students, we, it was a, it's a great organization. Over the last few years, especially, we've kind of gotten together over Zoom, and it's been a wonderful recreation of all that effort. But um, when we were here, um, there was a this group that we had. There was a um, some groups, uh, a group of folks did this five dollar installation club, which was um, anonymously made landscape interventions that made statements about the campus. We had. Um, uh, Ryan, who conceived and developed a photography competition which lasted year after year, year after year, um, kind of embracing zine culture. Berman Swale was developed at that point to just create a dialogue about landscape and just trying to make things interesting. And then we also had this weird, campy, can't get away with it today, boys of landscape coffee house presentation that occurred. Um, it was entertaining. We had a group of friends that really liked making a good time for everyone. And that's, I think, one of the things. We're in the community. We like a good time. Uh, with that, we wanted to give back. And a few years later, we, we started a, an award here called the Joys of Landscape. And we've been able to, over the last six years, I saw Naomi here somewhere, who was actually one of our recipients of the Joys of Landscape Award. Um, really, this is driven by the leadership of Ryan Washinsky and it has, has been a phenomenal thing to be a part of. Just to try, the scholarship's about, let's make the world a better place for students when you're in school, and try to use the concept of landscape architecture as a way to make it a better place. So we get to adjudicate what people are doing to do that. And with that, I would, to the students here, I'd recommend everyone make the world a better place for the students around you, the, the, your professors, the alumni, and the communities that you're engaged with. And we encourage you to submit. Um, to this award because we like getting lots of applications. To the alumni, uh, professors, everyone else here, students need our engagement and they need our money, so I would really uh, <laughs> suggest giving to those things. Um, you know what, I'll just personally do it. I know there's a 10 for Todd that's out there. I'm part of the LACF board as well. And I'll be one of the um, people participating in the 10 for Todd this year, which is to give money to increase the Frederick Todd Scholarship. These are important things that students can have the freedom to do the great things. So. Really, on behalf of the CSLA, um, congratulations on 50 years. Uh, I'll be back many more times, I'm sure, because I'm not leaving this city. And uh, we're looking forward to another 50 years. So thank you very much. So thank you very much, Bob. Very much appreciated. So, but some win, you know, I heard so many stories about your skating skills, some win, you have to show me something. I prepared a few slides for the next speaker. And I don't read everything, it might be a little bit blurry, but it's available online, and if I would read all the credentials, you know, we would be here almost all night long. Robert Bob first came to the University of Manitoba in 1968 as director of campus planning, moving from London, England, where he had practiced as an urban designer, architect slash planner. He quickly bonded with Alex Redray. Bob ran the first design studio of the new LA program and remained with the department until 1978. It was funny, we had a meeting, Zoom meeting, together with Ted. It was a conversation, and you guys you were playing pong pong with all these names, and I got somewhere lost. <laughs> but suddenly, and here I refer a little bit to, to, to Mimi, what happens 50 years ago? So, and we had discussions suddenly about design, landscape, and architecture. That was a model for winning entry, firstly before 1972, but that's what they built. And that's a very recent image because they celebrated their 50th as well. Munich, I think that I would say the most iconic may be landscape slash architecture, landscape architecture, interdisciplinary project, maybe in Germany. Look at the landscape. It's amazing. But maybe that was the origin. 55 years look good as well, Tracy. Have a look. No worries. Uh, that was in Montreal, Freie Otto, the German pavilion. 
And suddenly we were talking about the expo and I was so excited, you know, when Bob was referring to the habitat and the architect. That's maybe some chlorophyll actually ennobles the architecture. It's not too bad. And you still can go in today. So and Bob mentioned at that time there seemed to be such an excitement and the curiosity here in Canada for design and architecture. Maybe the spirit for creating these new programs and schools maybe came uh, actually was initiated somehow by the Expo. So we really invite our speakers. We ask for images to announce the talk. We received two images from Bob and he mentioned, quote, I prefer either of the attached photos since they are shot in memorable places. The Lisbon photo reflects my preferred habitat. A distinguished urban street, feel free to crop. I looked, I loved the street, the mosaic pavement, the trees, the buildings, and the happy men obviously enjoying this urban setting. We didn't crop. Bob, that's your habitat for the next couple of hours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, so how, how come I came to Winnipeg? Um, <laughs> well, I'll tell you about that. Um, first of all, well, thank you for inviting me. It's a, a, um, a welcome invitation and thank you. Anna and Deep, Deep Mind in particular. Um, I'd like to thank others who participated in this. Uh, 50 years, that, for most of you, or at least the younger half of this audience, that must be before you were born, and that must be, seem like ancient history. I was just whispering to Jennifer Rattray how old she was when, I, when she first came and when I first met Alex, she was three. <laughs> so that's, that tells you how old I am. Um, what I'm going to do tonight is to just give you a little of my version of history. Now, it may not be corroborated by others, but it's my version, and I'm going to stick to it. Um, it's, it's a vision, uh, it's a version of, of what was the ambition of this school? The ambition was excellence. The financial resources were minimal, and the strategy for making this department was opportunistic. But before talking about the program specifically, I want to give you a sense of the times and a lot of other people have already stolen my thunder on this. The, the, the Dean and Dietmar have already started to break onto this. I think my list is a little bit different. They're not entirely. I'm going then on to talk about um, a little bit more of my personal history as, as well as the uh, circumstances that led up to the making of the the department. So what was the context? Um, what, were the, what were the years like leading up to? And as Dietmar has mentioned, one of the key things in that period leading up to was the centennial. Uh, Expo, uh, as illustrated here, and particularly Habitat, but not just that. The centennial projects were spread across Canada. Every major city had centennial projects. Some weren't completed by 67, Winnipeg's for instance, the Manitoba Theatre Centre, the, um, the concert hall, the museum, the planetarium were done, I think were completed about 1970. They represented Canadian architecture and design, contemporary architecture and design, and a kind of fresh cultural priority. 
and encouraging design and, and artistic talent to thrive in Canada. The other thing was Trudeau mania. The USA had Richard Nixon and all his devious ways. Canada had Pierre Trudeau as Prime Minister, a hip, talented, cultured, athletic, intellectual, and fun-loving figure who was patron of design and artistic talent. He took canoe trips in the Canadian wilderness, lived in a house in Montreal designed by a key a Quebec architect, Ernest Cormier, and he was good friends with Arthur Erickson, one of Canada's most influential architects. There's an note. Vietnam War veterans, uh, 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 draft dodgers, were crossing the border into Canada. Jane Jacobs and the Colmai family amongst them uh, in just a few years before. Canadian popular music seemed to be running on high octane. There were requirements for Canadian content in radio and TV. There was Leonard Cohen, Joni Mitchell, Buffy St. Marie, <coughs> and others reflecting a Canadian experience. Winnipeg's own Guess Who were hitting their stride with albums that included such titles as Share the Land and Running Back to Saskatoon. And another really important thing that's also about celebrating 50 years was Canada's beating of the Soviet Union in the final seconds of the final game of the eight-game eight series against the USSR. Paul Henderson's winning goal was watched by most of the Canadian population, including uh, first-year students in the program and myself watching from a motel bar in Brandon, Manitoba, <laughs> supposedly on a studio field trip. <laughs> this, was the, this was the energy that was around when the program started. And it's, it, the landscape, what was going on in landscape architecture? What was the understanding of landscape architecture, particularly in Western Canada? in around 1970. Almost all practicing landscape architects in Canada were educated in the USA or Europe. There was little popular understanding of what landscape architecture is or could be, or what landscape architects might do. Landscaper or scraper or landscape gardener was perhaps the closest popular, popular perception. But the idea of landscape architecture, that, that landscape architecture could be a serious area of university study that was, was barely considered plausible, even, when the, or even within the halls of academe and, and certainly within the design professions of engineering, planning and architecture. The only other universities with landscape architecture programs in the country were just a few years old with Montreal, Guelph, and Toronto. These were undergraduate programs. Another important thing, I think, at that time was there was very little written about landscape architecture, very little material available. Ian McHarg's Design with Nature and the ASLA's um, Landscape Architecture magazine Apart from those, there was very little widely available critical or informative public publication on the subject of contemporary <coughs> landscape architecture and its Canadian history. Frederick Todd, him and his work across the country, was not well known or documented. And you've got to remember that Ron Williams' Landscape in Architecture in Canada was published in 2014. That's two generations after the start of this, almost two generations after the start of this program. Influential books like Jane Jacobs' Life and Death of the Great American Cities, Kevin Lynch's Image of the City, and Gordon Cullen's Townscape were certainly on landscape architects' shelves, but they were not specifically directed towards landscape architects. 
the internet, websites, computer graphics programs, Wikipedia, Google Satellite, and the Street Views, these, uh, these essential tools that we have today were at least 25 years away. We didn't know they were coming, of course. What seemed exciting to me at that time was that the profession of landscape architects, and don't forget this is the perspective of an urban designer coming from Britain, that the profession of landscape architecture in Canada was not clearly defined at that point. There was an opportunity to mold the clay that had not been hardened. And personally, I think that's still one of the profession's positive characteristics. There's still lots of room to bring further dimensions to the profession. Now a bit about my personal history of the landscape, of the landscape architecture program. I, as I explained earlier, and as publicized, I came to the University of Manitoba in 1968 which means I missed, missed the centennial year. As the newly appointed director of campus planning with the academic rank of associate professor. I did have some uh, teaching experience both in the UK and the US, but teaching wasn't my principal, principal interest. I had moved from private practice in London, UK, where I'd been working as an urban designer. Um, at that time it was, it was called architect planner on the planning of a new town and on large-scale urban redevelopment projects. I was attracted, and this is the explanation of why I came to Winnipeg, I was attracted by the exciting opportunities that seemed to be offered in, new, in this new and enterprising country. And the design and planning work that seemed to be going on at that time, Expo 67 had been published, and Scarborough College in Toronto some of you may, may be aware of that, had been publicized in Britain. I was particularly attracted to the prospect of running an office within an intellectually stimulating environment of a university. When I took over the campus planning office, there wasn't much work, uh, work wasn't much to work from, sorry. <laughs> there was very little recorded corporate memory. There was a large wooden model of the Fort Garry campus and some built landscape works by Dennis Wilkinson, who had left town a year or two before. And there was a small design advisory committee, Dean Roy Sellers, Dean of the faculty here, and R Ralph Rapson, renowned modernist architect and head of the school at the University of Minnesota. Through the first couple of years of running the campus planning office, I also assisted in the studios in environmental studies, as it was called at that time, and the architecture program, which was an undergraduate program at that time. This combination of professional work for the university and teaching was suited me very well. It also put me in touch with talented students who I might hire into the planning office which is something I've continued to do in my professional life beyond that. I think it was in the second year of my tenure, about 1970, when I was first introduced to Alexander Rattray. Known to most as Alex, but to me he was Al, or Big Al, and occasionally the Prairie Sod, who was periodically coming into Winnipeg from Rhode Island School of Design to scope out the projects the, the prospects of setting up the landscape architecture program within the faculty. His appointment also included assisting as landscape architect in the campus planning office. I, I think we enjoyed each other's company from the very first meeting. His experience with the Boston Redevelopment Authority and mine in London, UK, gave us early common bond. His approach to landscape design didn't seem different from mine in thinking about urban design. We both recognized that while landscape architecture was predisposed to understanding the natural environment, its principal concerns were in urbanized places. That meant having an understanding of a whole range of hard and soft subjects and disciplines. There was an obvious difference in the specifics but the notions of comprehensive design 
that considers a wide range of apparently contradictory factors of seeing the world as an interdep interdependency of natural and cultural factors, of maintaining, maintaining a sense of the big picture while acting on the small parts. It's obvious to me, and it was to Al, that urban design and landscape architecture were and, and are clearly members of the same family of cross-discipline design professions. I was also intrigued that Alex first graduated in architecture at University of Manitoba before studying landscape architecture slash planning at the University of Pennsylvania under Ian McHarg, who many may not know was also an architect, as were several other notable Canadian landscape architects of Alex's generation. There was a kind of McHargian mafia in Canada at that time. Um, people like Michael Huff and Peter Jacobs were all grads from, post-grads from, from University of Pennsylvania. My first working relationship with Alex was on campus planning issues, but our discussions often move to the new landscape architecture program and its ambition. As a member of the university's administration, I had some knowledge of the most helpful people in the admin department. And Alex often used me as a confidant and sounding board for ideas on the ambitions and the content of the program. I think I also provided a useful sh shoulder for him to cry on when things got really bad <laughs> and frustrating. The, now to the program itself, the original concept was simply to add an undergraduate program to the faculty. Uh, as I said before, architecture was at that time was, was also undergrad. And the idea shifted fairly quickly to the, to the, the, uh, the structure as we have it today, which is the uh, graduate departments of architecture, landscape architecture and, urban and uh, city planning. Uh, with an undergraduate program in what was then called environmental studies, now called environmental design. A, an entirely logical structure, but it meant in moving forward with the landscape architecture program, a whole lot of delay. We, we're, we're, the, the initial idea had to be then shifted, which meant uh, further negotiations with the Faculty of Graduate Studies and the provincial funding agencies and all those those involved in approving new graduate programs. What characterized the department most from the start was inadequate funding. This new program had to be started on the cheap. This, I came to learn, is a Winnipeg characteristic. <laughs> Don't buy anything unless it's wholesale. Al Rattery wanted excellence, the very best <clears throat> landscape architecture program that money could buy, but with very little money. His approach to stretching a small budget was to find the very best people from other disciplines within the university <clears throat> who could be persuaded to teach in landscape architecture for a minimum charge to the department. When the expert expertise wasn't available locally, then bring in experts from other universities to provide short courses in specific to topics. <clears throat> One of the reasons I, I got involved was because my salary was being paid by the administration as campus planning officer. <laughs> we were building a, a, a program on the cheap. <laughs> but the result of this approach to building excellence on a shoestring shoe <coughs> shoe shoe was a very rich, wide-ranging, and fast-changing program of study. How Al pulled this off, I never quite know. I suspect he had a heck of a Rolodex, and for many of you, you may not know what a Rolodex is. <laughs> um, and then calling all kinds of favors. In the first few years, there were visiting lectures or short courses <coughs> by academics and practitioners from Harvard, MIT, <coughs> uh, 
Berkeley, Penn, British Columbia, Montreal, Toronto, Ottawa, Saskatoon, and Winnipeg. Hugely rich program, and to be with it, only four students. Another related as aspect of the program was the unique, or at least unusual, open-endedness. While the general, there was a general sense of what students should be exposed to, the specific content of courses emanated from the very special interests and approaches of the individual teachers. I think that was absolutely key, and we argued that on out uh, over many dreams. There was no checklist of course content, but rather a broad definition of what was important. A course such as Process and Form, which you may or may not still have, that reflected the program's perspective and was a huge success, was built around individual presentations by people from a wide range of disciplines and backgrounds who were asked to respond to the thesis that process and form were somehow interrelated. The, the first couple of years of landscape architecture courses were offered before the program was approved. I, I remember it being under the banner of the city planning program, but others seem to disagree. And, and with shared courses with environmental studies. In the, as I said, there were four, four students in the first year. I ran the first design studio and a drawing course and organized a tour to California. And on that tour, Sea Ranch was a highlight. Alex, I think, ran a history, uh, history of landscape architecture course. I think he taught it that year, the first year. And other courses offered in environmental studies. The rest of the courses were offered by local or visiting academics and professionals or through special field courses. In, not the first year, thank you. In the first year, sorry, in the, it wasn't the first year, in the, in the earlier years, uh, we formed an alliance with Urban Studies Program at the University of Winnipeg under the leadership of, at that time, of Lloyd Axworthy. And we held a common studio and courses. Gary Hilderman offered courses in landscape design and construction, and Dieter Martin, groundskeeper at the University of Saskatoon, was a frequent visitor, usually brought in through the campus planning budget. He also organized an excellent short course in landscape materials and construction at his Saskatoon campus. Bob Newbery's insights and field, and field courses on stream behavior were highlights. His canoe trip memorable. In summary, with a little help from me, a little help and support, and a whole lot of blood, sweat, and tears, and then wavering attention to detail from Alex Rattery, the graduate LA program was launched 50 years ago. The ambition <clears throat> was excellence, the finances, financial resources minimal, the strategy was opportunistic. Capitalizing on the goodwill of local, national, and international talent, <clears throat> subsidizing budgets by drawing up from other people's pockets, maximizing opportunities for hands-on field courses, and field course experiences. The target was to help students develop design skills that are sensitive to the specifics of place within the broader perspective of the natural, of the nat natural and cultural worlds. The result, I believe, in, the, in those early years was a very rich program that was as much fun as it was educational and it was certainly educational for the so-called teachers as it was for the students. I left the program after about six years, so it's for others to fill in the, the, the period of maturation of this program. But I do hope the students who are entering the program this year will have as much fun as I did 50 years ago.
Bob, so thank you so much that you accepted our invitation to come to Winnipeg. And maybe it was a bit helpful, yeah, you know, that you have, that's my impression, many friends here. And thank you to a special, Cynthia, you know, for your help to picking him up from the airport, host him. I think you guys, you must have a good time. So thank you so much. Uh, I have to change soon, but maybe I introduce the next speaker first before we change the slides and to another slideshow. Charles, Charlie Thompson, was born and raised in Chicago, Illinois. In 1976, Charlie was invited to teach at the University of Manitoba. He came to Winnipeg to teach, joining a small department which consisted of full-time instructor Bob Alsop and part-time teachers Gary Hilderman, Jennifer Shea, and Bob Newberry. Charlie retired in 2007 and serves since then as a professor emeritus. Over his years in Manitoba, Charlie worked and still works on the International Peace Garden at the Manitoba North Dakota border. I think it's always a pleasure and wonderful to refer to gardens when you have to, a chance to introduce people. Welcome, Charlie. Just a second, Charlie, it's an older computer and always uh, takes a moment, so I have to. Uh, don't save. I can make the desktop, probably. I think it just should work. That's it. And full screen, isn't it? I think it should run, hopefully, yeah, if the timer is set. Is it, yeah. yeah, it runs. Uh, no, no, that's, no, uh, that's, that's, so, that's so sorry. <laughs> no. Same thing again. Wendy, please go ahead. Things haven't changed. Got <laughs> <laughs> the slide, slide deck out. Yeah, you can move past that. Move past that? Yeah, move into the other. Yeah, well, that, that? stop there. That's good. Okay. And it just let them roll. Think, uh, yeah. Thanks, Brandy. No Thanks. problem. Thank you. With that kind of introduction, I always feel like I should have uh, dirt under my fingernails and uh, calluses on my hand, etc. But uh, that's not always the case. I take it you can hear me. Um, I'm just—I'm not going to speak to any specific slides. They're just going to roll right on. So entertain yourself with that. You'll see some very familiar faces, you'll see some very strange and new faces, but uh, uh, every now and then if I catch a glimpse, I might make some remark about it. I came to Manitoba after the dust had begun to settle, you know, <laughs> after everything that Bob had gone through. Um, I, I, I want to thank uh, the organizers, Dittmar and Anna, for inviting me to do a little bit of reminiscing here. I always enjoy doing that. I guess in your later years, you begin to enjoy it even more. But in 1975, I, I started looking for a full-time teaching job. Uh, I was in private practice, and I'll just make a little bit of diversion here. The office I was working in, we were working with Moshi Softy down in Baltimore doing a new community, Cold Spring New Community, and I tell you, that was one of the most exciting projects I've worked on. That's Dennis Wilkinson, mid-60s. He's the first landscape architect, really important landscape designer, 
early on, uh, many more right now, sitting right in this room, but at that time, that's his drawings for Al Rattray's annex to the Russell Building. When Al retired in 94, Dennis did this beautiful sketch and we presented it to him as a going away present. Anyway, getting back to what I was saying, um, in 19, 1975, I was looking for a teaching job and one morning, very, very early by the way, I was on my way to the office working in Philadelphia and out of the blue I get a phone call and who was on the other end of the phone? Al Rattray. And I since then have learned that Al did his most important phone calls either very late at night or very early in the morning. And I began to wonder if this guy ever slept. You know, it, it was really something. He asked me two questions. Are you serious about teaching? And, are, and the second, would you be interested in moving to Canada? And my answer to both of them was absolutely, and I would move to Canada as long as it was on the prairies. I was anxious to get back to the Midwest. Anyway, um, by the, that weekend I was on the plane out to Winnipeg, which I had never heard of before. I had never been here before. And I was on the plane for an interview with the, with the staff here that were at, in present here. Um, I was really intrigued by what Al told me, what he was trying to do here in, the pro, uh, on the, in this university, and it was very convincing. And as some of you realize, Al can be, a, or was, a very convincing fellow. Anyway, um, I, I accepted the teaching job, and uh, that was, and the rest is history. 46 years of history, by the way. This month, we've been here 46. It's funny, I was called aside by one of the practicing landscape architects in town uh, when I was being interviewed, and he says, you take the job, you'll be here for six months, and you'll be gone. Uh, and I, what? That's kind of a strange thing, but that seemed to be a pattern with some of the uh, people who came out, you had to love this place. And after my visit and introduction to the people in this department, I fell in love with the people and the place. And that's what really caused me to, uh, to commit long term to this place. Now, Bob has already talked about uh, three things. The excellence, the striving of excellence in, in the new department limited financial resources, and an opportunistic strategy. All right, I'm gonna expand on that. I agree with those, they're very true. This is the UMSU, Carl Nelson architect who was part of the staff in landscape architecture mid-70s came on. That was one of his projects that he worked on, the design of UMSU. Um, anyway, <laughs> I get diverted here. Bob's mentioned, uh, I'm gonna talk about limited resources. It wasn't just financial resources, it was everything. <laughs> you know, to find in sufficient teaching resources, you really had to be innovative. Google hadn't been invented yet. Come on, this is 1975. And so we had to find our projects, the images of these projects, and the books and the magazines that we found on the library shelves. The problem was, and Bob made reference to that, there was very limited publications about landscape architecture that was available in the library. Um, there were plenty of articles on the more popular landscape architects and architects, but there was very little written about the lesser known individuals that were really important in creating an evolving Canadian landscape. So the, the only solution, every summer I packed my kids and wife up into a Volkswagen van and we just headed off to distances unknown or known uh, and did a lot of photographing in place of a lot of these projects. That's what we had to do. 
There wasn't the big resources that you could use and you have with Google today, my God. I'm very envious I should start over school again. It's, anyway, the only thing is you should be talking to my kids when I talk about that because their answer was, oh, dad, not another stop, you know, and I would hop out of the car and go photograph something while they sat in the hot sun trying to read a book or do whatever, you know, keep their younger brother or sister entertained. Anyway, so it was a matter of limited resources and now I'm sitting with thousands of slides that no one really wants because it's, <laughs> it's a lot easier to download these images off of Google, you know, so what do you do? Anyway, the other thing is computers weren't yet available or invent, well they were, they're, they're starting to come on. We used the old, well, it was pretty primitive, the type of computers at this time. But for instance, I didn't have a typewriter in my office, no, and I certainly didn't have a personal commuter, uh, computer. So the, the correspondence scenario in our office was on Monday, I would sit down with a pen and ink and write longhand on a yellow pad of paper a letter to some person that I was trying to communicate with, then I would hand it over to the, t the secretary for the typing. On Tuesday, she would then return the type draft of that letter to me for corrections, okay? So we're moving on. Wednesday, I returned the letter to her with all my corrections for a final typing on university stationery, neatly all laid out for my signature. And, and then Thursday, I signed the letter and passed it back to the secretary to have her mail it. Whoa, wait a minute now, Charlie, you're way ahead of the game because Al Rattray got hold of the letter then. <laughs> and he did a final editing of that letter. He dotted every I and he crossed every T, and it was necessary, really. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, it was a real surprise for me. Anyway, Friday afternoon, finally all the corrections were made and it was ready for mailing, okay? Of course, they missed the mail and it didn't go out until Monday morning. So anyway, so much for that. It was a limitation on all resources. Opportunistic strategy was required, certainly, but it required co collaboration. Alex brought together a very talented and dedicated group of individuals to teach in the program. Each one had the knowledge and a passion for what they were teaching and it was certainly conveyed through their interactions with the students. They were really a, a, a talented group. The strategy I witnessed in the program was one of collaboration. A lot of these, that's Bob Newberry, this is Jennifer Shea with the students out in Delta Marsh doing their, their studies. Um, in, in these pictures, you will see field trip after field trip after field trip. The whole staff went on field trips together. You didn't have just an instructor always out in the field, you had Bob Newberry to talk about the water on that particular site, or Jennifer Shea to talk about some of the plant communities, or you had Gary talking about some of the design possibilities. There was a whole collaborative atmosphere that was at work here in the faculty, or in our department at this time. You had Jennifer Shea, Bob had mentioned they were assigned elsewhere. Jennifer Shea was in the Faculty of Botany, botany uh, program. Or Bob Newberry was over in the Freshwater Institute. Or we had Louis Lenz from the Plant Science Department. They all came in to teach a course at no expense to the department. They were assigned in these other units. Al was a master at handling this type of organization. Now, a lot of the, the individuals who were teaching in the early program each had an individual teaching style and a u unique way of getting the message across to the students. You had Bob, with his very probing investigation of issues. 
and asking the very challenging questions that many of the students didn't want to hear or even think about. Or you had Carl Nelson with his wicked sense of humor. <laughs> Some of you maybe are familiar with it, but he caused the student through that process a sense of humor to cause them to think twice about what they were doing and why they were doing it. Or you had Jennifer Shea who said, keep doing it until you do it right. You know, it, there was a whole strategy to the teaching. The willingness to collaborate was critical to the department's success. And the staff were expected to pitch in and help out wherever it was needed. You'll see here some of the, right in this room, I don't know how many times it's now passed on, right in this room, we turned this into a forest. I remember, who was it, Mike Scatliff and his crew went out on a Friday afternoon and they got into an Aspen Bluff. They cut all the trees down, hauled them back to the university, and we constructed over the weekend for a, an exhibit of student work a forest, and you'll, in here you'll see some of the pictures. Anyway, that was really teamwork that allowed us to do that stuff. He was, Alex was always successful in finding the right talent or skill to meet the challenge in order to provide academic needs. Many courses found the, in the program, I will say one thing, many of the courses that we had, or at the time were evolving, had started as a lecture component to the design studio. That was part of the collaborative or team effort. You would have, in some cases, it was the history course, or uh, the plant, plant materials, or planting design course, were lecture components to studios that you would then address in the, through the studio work. I'll just sort of wrap this up with two, two little issues. Well, one here, Alex striving for excellence. He always was looking for the right teaching moment and he had a deep concern for every student's improvement in their own personal skills. I remember in the first year, the first month, we were back and we attended a barbecue out at LaBarrier Park. It was the, like a homecoming barbecue for the department out on LaBarrier Park. And in the midst of a friendly touch football game, the game just stopped. And Al went over, grabbed the football, and went to this young international student who had never seen a football before in their life or even understood what football, the game of football was, and he sat down and gave him instructions on to how to hold and throw a football. <laughs> I was just shocked by this. I was used to sandlot football games where none of that kind of etiquette occurred, you know. Here it was a learning experience and a teaching moment, and Al would not pass that up for any any mean. Anyway, th th there was a lot of that that went on within the department. The one thing I will add to Bob's comment of three principles that the department worked on is the human factor. And, and they, they were very important, I feel, in, in, to me and, and to the success of the department. They, during the move, our move from, or uh, from well, from Philly to Winnipeg, there was one small and seemingly unimportant issue that seemed to be holding up the works for us. And I sat down and I, on one of the phone conversations I had that, with Al, I related what the issue was. Well, you see, I've got a five-year-old who's losing his two front teeth. And he's concerned there might not be a tooth fairy in Canada. <laughs> And, and Al sort of, there was a silence on the phone, and by God, within a couple of days, my son had a personal postcard from Alex saying, yes, Eric, there is a tooth fairy in Canada. So, <laughs> yeah, I was, I was floored, but 
it's that thoughtful and meaningful gesture that I wish witnessed during my early days in the department. That empathy that he had for individual need was right at his central core. The other thing I'll relate is during the final days of my interview here in the, de the in department, we were up on the third floor of Umsu uh, on a westward facing room late in the afternoon looking, overlooking the campus and in the midst of a serious discussion about <clears throat> this or that in the, in the interview process, there was a deep sigh heard at one end of the table and, and there was silence and it said, oh, isn't that beautiful? <laughs> and we sort of, go ahead, go ahead, Charlie. Okay. Anyway, you, you just interrupted my beautiful <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, we became, we realized what the remark was made about. It was the sunset and we just all sat there. Yeah, it was beautiful. I, and it just confirmed that, boy, the values of the people here in this room or in this department were very akin to what my values were and I really felt close and, and it was a place that we wanted to be. Anyway, 50 years, this is 50 years young, by the way, people. You're just starting out on the road and there's a long future ahead of us and I think it's really important to understand where you've been to know where you can possibly go, okay? Um, I don't know if anyone wants to say anything about these images. They're interesting. They're also running in, the, in room 210. There was supposed to be another set of images flowing out in the middle, but I didn't see them earlier. Chris Varys in, in Toronto had put together a nice set of images. and. I don't know, has anyone seen those? They're there now, good. But that's, that's Carl Nelson, that's Ted and Ross McGowan playing cribbage in our lounge in the, Rus in the, uh, the Bison Gym. Ted, do you recognize yourself? <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Bob Allsup's drawings, sketches. I had to put those in. Okay, thank you. Charlie, thank you very much for this entertaining presentation. Sorry for interrupting. And we still have some shortages, you know, uh, for instance, sort of storage space. So that means we can't promise you that we can store all the treasures in your basement, but we might ask you for permission you know, to show these slides a little bit more often and to share them you know, with a larger audience, our students, alumni, and so on. Can we have your permission right now? Should we talk later about this? <laughs> Thank you very much. You got your first permission from everyone. In the <laughs> <laughs> so I stopped this slideshow and, you know, during the entire evening, uh, we will have slides on display. I go back to this one because we have a few more images prepared for our next presenter here. In November 2019, we received a message, you know, an email, a letter written by Jennifer Moore Redray through Mala. So the association learned today that Alexander E. Redray passed away on November 25th, 2019. A couple of excerpts from that letter because I think it was very touching. Quote, Alex, uh, Jennifer, sorry. 
Alex was committed to Winnipeg, the Prairies, and his students, and spent his career at UM, where he was gift a gifted professor with a passion for the natural world, good design, and accessible public space. On retirement, he was named a senior scholar and then a professor emeritus in recognition of his distinguished service. In addition to his family, friends, and profession, Alex loved reading, politics, sports, sailing, long canoe trips, classical music, Scotch whiskey, and Welsh corgis. And one of his favorite projects was one of his first, a small park designed with neighborhood children in Providence, Rhode Island. After bringing their ideas to life, the children described their enchanted garden, quote, the garden was created when a star fell and all the pieces became bits of the garden. It is the power within the star that made the garden magic. Whenever everyone enters the garden, they become playful. With Alex passing, quote again, Jennifer from your letter, we like to think there's one more shining star in the sky. Welcome, Jennifer, and she's here with his son. I didn't ask you for your name, so you might recognize your grandpa, I guess. So, Jennifer, please, and I have a few slides here. If you, yeah, okay. Just push the button here for backwards. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, all of you, uh, for being here. It's so wonderful uh, to be here today. I'm going to be very brief because I know I'm standing between you and another refreshment uh, or cake. So I will be very brief. And, and we've had two wonderful uh, presentations. Thank you so much, Bob. And, and thank you so much, uh, Charlie. Um, Jennifer Moore Rattre. I'm a really proud member of Papikasis uh, Cree Nation just over the border in Saskatchewan and also really proud to be the uh, daughter of that man, uh, Alexander Rattre, uh, a really superb human being and a really superb dad. I'm going to talk just for two minutes and, and just share, share a little bit. Um, I do want to thank you, Dietmar, so much for the land acknowledgement. That is so important, so I'm so glad that we are doing that now and being thoughtful about it. Um, I also want to, to thank you, uh, you Anna and, and you Mimi, for the kind invitation. It is such a privilege to be here uh, to celebrate the 50th of the Department of Landscape Architecture. Uh, my dad was a really proud product of this university, and in turn, he had a chance to give back to this university. Um, as Bob mentioned, he earned his Bachelor of Architecture degree here at U of M, and then thanks to one of the very first Canada Council fellowships, he was able to pursue a master's degree in landscape architecture at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, on graduation, he worked in Boston and Worcester, where I was born, uh, before becoming chair of uh, landscape at the Rhode Island School of Design. And as you've heard, in 1967, he had the opportunity to come home and to help develop uh, and head a program of landscape architecture. So I really grew up here. And I remember my dad, and many of you, in those early years. Um, leaving the house by 7 a.m. and arriving home close to 12 hours later, uh, working evenings and weekends to try and make his lectures and his uh, studios and the department continuously better. Uh, my dad made such a commitment to his students, uh, to his colleagues who remained friends throughout his entire life um, and his work, um, that uh, work-life balance was never one of the things my dad was really good at, uh, but that's okay. Um, he cared deeply for this university and he worked with his colleagues like Bob, uh, like Charlie, uh, like Ted, where are you Ted, there you are, like Ted. Um, and, uh, and some colleagues who have, uh, who have passed on as well, uh, such as Carl Nelson, uh, such as Gary Hilderman. 
um, and, and dedicated more than 30 years of his life to really creating and helping to be a part of creating this gem on the prairies. That is really what you are. Uh, one of the best, I think the best, but I might be slightly biased, program in landscape architecture in Canada and, and one of the best in the world. Um, my father really believed in his students and he wanted them to have the best possible experience. He believed in diversity and equity and inclusion long before our current and very overdue focus on that. Uh, maybe in part um, because my mother was Cree. He was a feminist and said how could he be anything else when he had two daughters. He believed that the program and the university was better with students from around the world when they had the opportunity to come to Winnipeg and to join and work together with students from Manitoba and students from Canada and that together we would learn from each other and we would enrich each other. So I've told the story before, but I remember one night driving around Winnipeg picking up pots and pans and, and uh, gently used bedding uh, from family friends because a student was coming from another part of the world with his wife and small children and didn't have anything. Um, with another colleague, uh, he found them an apartment and the basics to help them start their program successfully and to help them start their new life. On his sabbatical years, my dad explored the world. He lectured and taught in countries uh, from India to Indonesia, and, uh, and with my wonderful stepmom, uh, Angela Louvre, created the Italian Studies program and ran it for close to a decade here. So Megan and I had, to, had a quick chat about that. It was really wonderful to see Bob and Megan here today giving back to your profession in the roles that you now have, the really important roles. Um, my dad also had an opportunity to do that and, and also to be an advisor uh, to the International Federation of Landscape Architects. So we're so honored that on his retirement, his department colleagues established the Alexander E. Rattray Scholarship in Landscape Architecture, to which we continue as a family to contribute. Um, and I know there are so many other amazing scholarships and awards here uh, created. Bobby spoke of one today, a fun one, um, to support students here and to support their life when they're going through the really rigorous programming here. And that is so important. And I really think it's, it's our collective responsibility to do what we can in whatever way we can. Maybe it's money, maybe it's time, maybe it's a little bit of both. But to really try and give back and, and really try and create a better world for not just the generation ahead, but the seven generations ahead. My dad passed away, uh, Dietmar, as you, as, you, as you mentioned, sadly, just before the pandemic began. And I am so pleased that the department and the university, uh, I understand, will be planting a tree on the campus in my dad's name in the spring. A tremorial, you called it, which I think is really beautiful. You have a wonderful way with words, Dietmar. <laughs> Um, my father was principled and creative and intelligent and curious and kind. He had high expectations and held himself to the very same high standards. And, you know, it was pretty scary as a, you know, grade four student if my, you know, assignment wasn't done exactly perfectly because he knew I could do better. But, uh, but so many important, beautiful lessons that he taught me. He really was an exceptional human being who really saw the best in everyone and the true beauty in the world. So thank you so much for inviting me and my family, my son Tristan, my husband had a, a, unfortunately a work uh, event, he's a coach so he wasn't able to be here today, but to invite us to be a part of your wonderful celebration and for allowing me to pay a very small tribute to all of you who, who are together co-creating this incredible special magical program and in, in this wonderful faculty at this really fantastic university. Sometimes we don't really realize how great things are until we go other places, but this really fantastic gem that you are co-creating and, and a part of every single day. So, Egosani, uh, Chimigwech, and thank you so much. It's been wonderful to be here tonight. Maybe two more announcements. Alex, boss. So Alex is our is a BA honors in geography from Mount Allison University, 13, MLA candidate, University of Manitoba, LASA president, FASA chair, MLA student affiliate. Alex, are you in the room? Yeah, please come on. on.
Thanks, Dima. You managed to make me sound kind of impressive there for a second. <laughs> um, it's really great to be here with everyone tonight, as uh, mentioned earlier, in person, not on Zoom. What a treat. Uh, my first day of classes a few weeks back. It felt like my first day, even though it's my third year here, because uh, I am a, a COVID student. Um, when I was applying for my master's in the before times, um, <laughs> the U of M was instantly my number one choice. Um, and that was for two reasons. One, because uh, of the amazing professors we have here. Um, Anna and Dietmar, oh, did I start something? Oh. <laughs> um, Anna and Dietmar had just won their Lila Award for Rooted in Clay, and I was just so jazzed about the possibility of learning under them and also because this was the oldest program in Canada. And after being here, I realized that that longevity really is due to the quality of the academic work here and our academic community. Um, on that note, thanks so much to Brandy. <laughs> I don't even know how she does what she does, but <laughs> she truly keeps the wheels on the bus. <laughs> So thanks to Brandy and Dietmar and Dean Mimi and Anna and everyone else who has put together tonight and all of the other events that we're having this year. I'm really excited that this is our year. <laughs> um, I feel like a lot of the time the architects get the center spotlight, but this is our year and I'm really excited for it. Um, before you guys get too, you know, excited chatting to each other, um, I would love if you come to see me by uh, the table out there. Uh, you might have noticed my really nice shirt that I'm wearing tonight. Uh, Jordan Cantafio, he's another MLA student here. He is one of the co-presidents of ADIPSA, which is the Indigenous Design um, and Planning Student Association. He designed this shirt for us. It's a fundraising shirt. It's a 50th anniversary shirt. Uh, the money is going towards our scholarship. Um, it was really neat tonight. I got to meet someone that I was a recipient of one of their scholarships, and I just can't express how helpful that is. Um, obviously, we all need money, but it just it feels really great to be recognized and to know that there is that support in the community. I think that Manitoba, Winnipeg, Mala, we really do feel like a community because we're smaller. Um, so if you can support us by getting yourself a spiffy shirt, we would love that. Um, we're also selling the bulbs uh, out there as well that are also going towards the scholarship. And I just hope that everyone enjoyed the evening. It was awesome and, uh, and keep enjoying it. So thank you. And join us for future events like Atmosphere in February. Thank you so much, Alex. And also, you know, we, we, it's, our program is very challenging and time consuming. And you are volunteering so much time, you know, for being president, Laza, and helping organizing these kind of events. So thank you very much to you and all the other students who are volunteering their time, you know, tonight and for other events. Without you, it wouldn't be possible to get something like this organized. So thank you very much. So maybe a few more slides I go through very, very, very quickly. Because again, we want to feed a student, uh, MLA 50th anniversary student scholarship. So we have to advertise ourselves, ourselves a little bit and our selling store in front or in between the courtyard in the foyer. So a little bit personal since I'm here, I always try to have friend, friendly assaults on Canadian lawns. And that was actually an American lawn, I forgot Mother's Day. But that was uh, maybe one of the first projects here on campus, maybe about Fiction One. Just a little bit of an injection into a Canadian lawn. No, with Lots of, translated in no with lots of. They arrived after re receiving their passports. It was really a long, long voyage from, they came from Europe, New York, Montreal, 
and I think then they are in Canada, but it was an issue to bring them from for <clears throat> maybe French-speaking site into to, to Manitoba, but finally they made it. So we organized the planting, and again here with the help of the students, we made it before the ground got frozen. In the first spring, no, they did so well. In the Canadian aviators, they seemed to like them. In the second season, they didn't come back. And it's a bit speculative, you know, I'm guessing a little bit. Maybe they never experienced snow. That year we had snow, maybe second or third of May. It was a bit too late. Or the next guess, maintenance. And that's something we have to learn, you know, when you brush and broom your lawn. For them, it's almost like a guillotine, and then it's done. So they never appeared again. But again, you know, this wonderful landscape, the Super Bowl, worked untouched and referring to Dennis Wilkerson's work, the contoured landscape. No, we didn't want to change or touch what was done before in a beautiful way, so it's still there. But there's a second attempt here on campus, Bald Fiction 2. That's our working title. That's actually the title on the shirts, isn't it, Alex? So they finally arrived. Bill Moore Golden Circle in front of the building, right into the berry, and the natives and the foreigners, they hopefully will enjoy and support each other. 500 square meters. That's the mixture, 18,500. I can tell you, if we won't have the support from students again, we won't be able to make it. But I'm sure that students are willing to help and to support this project. And again, just yesterday, you know, the towers, the entrance, didn't replace the Russell building, but 18,500 arrived. So we are in preparation of the plantings with the help of physical plant. My preferred method would be an uncontrolled burn, but I think I won't get permission for that. <laughs> and that's what it could be, hopefully, next year in spring, when the pollinators will have their party. And we might have, you know, today a renaissance, maybe we might have a vinissage with the flowers and the tremorial. That would be wonderful. So we try to achieve a cohabitation. So buy your bulbs today, they are available here, 20 bucks for 10 bulbs. And there's place everywhere if you don't have a garden. Again, I mentioned the, landscape, the campus landscape is your, yours. You can do a little bit of guerrilla gardening. <laughs> With regards to this project, I want to thank you know, this woman in Toronto. Without her, Caroline, it was incredible to have her support in this project. And we are almost done. I just would like to announce a few upcoming events. We have a whole series, or better, running events. Yesterday, there was a, uh, well, maybe we don't, oh, don't need the slide. Don't know where it's gone. So there was the vernissage for an exhibition in the ARC 2 gallery. So feel free. I think it's open, Mimi. The, can we go in or is the building closed? I think the building's probably closed? Maybe it's closed, I don't know. Marcy, Fritz, do you know? Uh, okay, it's too bad, but you know, it will, I, as far as I understood, it will be on display up to October, isn't it? So feel free to come back and enjoy Craig Milligan's work. Fantastic work. I can take all. You can, Mimi. Do you all see? Oh, we, oh, an entire group. Okay, that would be great. Okay. Okay, we'll find a way to make it accessible. Would be wonderful. A next event already scheduled will be Atmosphere uh, 15, Land Plus. So Fritz and Marcy committed to uh, take care for Atmosphere, so we'll keep you posted. But 
It's already scheduled Thursday, February 2nd to Saturday, February 4th. And then we'll have a series of really high profile lectures which will be announced soon. Please check our website and you will get maybe messages through our channels, Mala and so on. Uh, yeah, bulb flowering, tree planting, vinissage, something in spring. So we are in contact with Les Velvet, you know, our arborist. The hope is that we can go in the nursery maybe together to mark a tree before we bring it here. Would be fantastic. And there's already, you know, an agreement that we will have a nice spot somehow close to the Russell building. So the building architecture and landscape still agreed to work together. <laughs> I take a risk acknowledgement. So thank you. But this list is completely incomplete and then you can get a little bit in trouble. Uh, maybe I can complete this list for the, you know, centennial for the next anniversary. <laughs> but nevertheless, thank you to Ted and Charlie for meeting over the summer to discuss this gathering and provide, you know, uh, 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 suggestions and uh, great advice. Uh, thank you again, Cynthia, for helping out, for being the host for our guests. Thanks to the Dean's office, Mimi, for your unbureaucratic support. Very much appreciated. Great. Thanks to all the students volunteering their time. But a very special thanks to Chris Lee for gathering all the slideshows. And here it was uh, Charlie collected all of them in his home. And I don't know all the names, therefore the list is incomplete. And for saving the old slide projectors, you know, <laughs> over there. Otherwise, those slides, you know, the carousel wouldn't be on display tonight. And last but not least, <clears throat> follow up, Alex Brandy. Without words. I think it's time for a cut. We cut the cake and Brandy was asking me before she starts to cut that all the speakers should come to the cake maybe for an image. So if you don't mind, and then feel free to get a cake, take a drink, and you know, I think, can I do this or maybe to open the buffet? So do, I think that's, the buffet is open. yeah, it's already open. open. Okay. <laughs> Let's go. Thank you very much.